we can add people as we go. Good morning and afternoon. And welcome to the second webinar, hi Jesse, on local impacts of the global pandemic presented by the Women's Giving Circle of Missoula County. My name is Terry Goldich and I'm the chair of the steering committee. Please feel free to turn your cameras on and use the chat feature for questions. The Women's Giving Circle's mission is to inspire collaborative giving to strengthen our community. Begun in 2018, the Women's Giving Circle is a program of the Missoula Community Foundation and its members have given so far $27,000 in grants. Our usual process is that the membership votes on the focus of the grant, such as the environment, women's and children's issues, uh, housing, among others, and invites nonprofits in Missoula County to apply for a grant. The first $10,000 grant went to the level program at the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. The second $10,000 grant went to Free Cycles of Missoula. When it be became clear that the global pandemic would have terrible consequences, we voted to give an immediate grant of $5,000 to the YWCA of Missoula to support its essential services. In face of continuing needs, we are now in the process of fundraising to grant an additional amount in the near future. The Women's Giving Circle website is accessed from missoulacommunityfoundation.org. You can also find us on Facebook at Women's Giving Circle of Missoula County. Becoming a member is easy. We require a minimum donation of $120, which can be paid in monthly or quarterly installments and have tiered donation levels to allow for socioeconomic diversity with giving levels at 120, 300, 600, and $1,200. You can become a member today by donating through the website, allowing you to contribute to the annual focus area and vote for grantees in the year you donate or by sending a check to the Missoula Community Foundation office at P.O. Box 8806, Missoula, Montana, 59807. You will find a community of philanthropic sisters working together to use donations to affect change and learn how to be a more intentional and impactful giver. This webinar series was conceived to bring the latest information to our membership and the greater community presented by local experts in the areas of financial, medical and social impacts. We invite you to join us for a summer, all of the summer webinar series, which is available to our membership and the public without charge and will be presented during the lunch hour for easy access. We have never experienced a lockdown on a global level like the one we are experiencing now. We understand it is for the collective health of our community, but it has also hit some of our neighbors and community members harder than others. To better understand the impact of isolation and loss, we have invited Susan Kohler from Missoula Aging Services and Dr. Tina Barrett from Tamarack Grief Resource Center to talk about the impact on our community and how we can help our families, friends, neighbors, and ourselves. I'd like to introduce our speakers, Susan Kohler. Susan Kohler is the CEO for Missoula Aging Services and has a BA in Gerontology from Kent State University in Ohio with more than three decades of experience in community development and nonprofit management. She joined Missoula Aging Services in 1983 and has served as CEO since 1989. During her career, Senator Max Baucus appointed her twice as a representative to the White House Conferences on Aging. Ms. Kohler has been a presenter at numerous local, regional, and national conferences and forums that address issues affecting older adults. In addition, she has served two years as president of the Montana Area Agency on Aging Association and is currently the co-chair to their legislative committee. And Tina Barrett, Dr. Tina Barrett, who holds a doctorate in education from the University of Montana, is the co-founder and executive director of Tamarack Grief Resource Center. Dr. Barrett has focused on stabilizing strength-oriented support for trauma survivors and family systems since 1994. Specializing in nature-based grief support, Dr. Barrett has facilitated bereavement groups and grief camps since 1996 and offered facilitator training and supervision for over 20 years. Dr. Barrett is honored to serve on the board of directors for the National Alliance for Grieving Children and as a senior consultant for the Tragedy Assistance Programs for Survivors, as well as on the leadership team of Project Tomorrow Montana. Dr. Barrett received the 2019 Community Educator Award from the Association of Deaf Educators and Counselors. 
I'd like to welcome everyone and thank Ms. Kohler and Dr. Barrett for leading this webinar for the Women's Giving Circle of Missoula County. My colleague Nikki will be monitoring the chat feature and will let us know any questions that come in. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Susan Kohler. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for attending this very important topic of social isolation and loneliness. Um, I'd like to thank the Missoula Community Foundation, um, uh, Marcy and Nikki for putting this together and inviting me for the opportunity to speak today. I am sorry that I don't have a PowerPoint because I want this to be as much engaging as possible um, for you to ask questions. But I often like to start with what the mission of Missoula Aging Services is. We promote the independence, dignity, and health of older adults and those that care for them. Last year, we served over 30,000 uh, people who uh, accessed our services and called for information. I like to uh, break our services into four categories. Um, we provide in-home services. We do advocacy work. Um, we have a resources uh, that people can call and get a very person-centered opportunity to learn what services are available for them. We're connected nationally and, and um, within our own state. So even if you have a loved one that lives in another state or in another part of our state, we can give you a lot of information about what to expect and, and um, also give you the phone number of the person who could give similar services and information for wherever your loved one lives. So I encourage you to call us if you have ever any questions about services available for an older adult or a caregiver. And we also have volunteer opportunities. Um, our foster grandparent, senior companion, and RSVP program are some of our core programs that we do. And when we talk about social isolation, these are some of the programs that really help older adults deal with social isolation. Our vision uh, at Missoula Aging Services, which seems to be very timely, um, is that MES is the vo voice of older adults. We provide programs and services in our communities, empowering people to age with confidence and without fear. That was just done during our strategic process last year. We didn't have any idea that confidence and fear would be such a big topic uh, with the pandemic that we're currently experiencing. I wanna talk a little bit about how we define social isolation and loneliness. Um, in that it's important to know that they aren't the same, they are different. As many of you probably know, you could be with a group of people and feel pretty lonely. Um, and you can be socially isolated by choice and be just fine and not lonely. So it's important to recognize there's, uh, you can have both, but uh, the loneliness is what we focus on and we focus on how we can prevent that loneliness and it, sometimes it is by not having them being socially isolated, but due to disability, they may not be able to connect in the community like you normally can. And especially with the way family members are all over the country um, and looking for work, and they're not in the same community as their older adult. Um, and loneliness uh, is something that often comes about by the individual perceiving that people don't care um, about them and they don't have that same kind of connection to love and support as they perceive others to have. Recently, uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Yashimura and his student uh, Elizabeth Sholeev uh, from the University of Montana's Department of Communication Studies um, did a study in, uh, with support from Missoula Aging Services on social isolation. We help recruit older adults for this uh, study, and the outcome of, a, of the study, along with many other, uh, one of the main things that came about was that the study uncovered a number of thoughts participants had about their loneliness. The findings indicate that loneliness occurs primarily by the perceived unavailability of others particularly loved ones. Loneliness is considered a significant health risk, and most studies suggest that loneliness is a psychologically distressing experience. 
And this was before we had COVID-19. Some of the ways that we have helped in the past with uh, social isolation and loneliness are through the services that we have. And some of the quotes to hear for people, uh, the benefit of that is, without you in MAS, I have no one. No one calls, no one visits, no one cares, except you and MAS. And this is from an 81 year old woman. MAS was there for me at an unbearable time in my life and gave me support, friendship, and a reason to get up every day. They are there for so many people and help in so many ways. So the first quote was from a woman who obviously doesn't have the same kind of social supports that many of us do. And we have programs where we connect with her through volunteer services, um, seniors helping seniors. And we also, the other quote was from a volunteer. And that's one of the impacts of social isolation and loneliness is keeping people engaged. And many times older adults, it's through volunteer services. When the pandemic hit and we were shut down, Missoula Aging Services was considered an essential service. Um, we aren't the same as the healthcare services, but we do deliver, for example, our Meals on Wheels program. We have community lunch programs at the senior citizen centers around our county. Uh, we also oversee Ravalli County that also has these types of services. And everything shut down and we had to retool our Meals on Wheels program to have, since they are delivered predominantly by older volunteers. So that, as you know, was an at-risk group, is an at-risk group. So we try to lessen the connection to the clients that we were receiving by uh, rotating services. Typically, we did five days a week and in um, this situation we would deliver twice a week and the rest were frozen and then we also offered uh, those that were isolated to if they wanted to get meals they could call and we would serve them and so we increased uh, by about 30 percent the number of people who received meals on wheels um, the community lunch programs at senior centers also shut down, which is another important part for social prevention and social isolation, is those activities and community lunches. It's both nutrition and the ability to socialize. We help the centers roll out what they call a grab and go, so they could continue to produce the meals for older adults, but they would drive through the parking lot and get their meal and head home, and they could do that five days a week, and they could ask for multiple meals in order to uh, cover um, their food needs for a day. Uh, and we found that particularly pop popular with individuals who, who really are what we call in the digital gap. Um, they don't really um, use uh, they don't use the internet, they don't have smartphones, they don't know how to order groceries online. All of that was pretty traumatic for people when they were stuck at home and didn't have support systems. So we were able to help them through other methods, but we did uh, realize there is such a significant gap in technology with our older adults that it's something that we're going to have to figure out how to solve. Um, we also provide homemaking services and respite services and personal care services. We shut down homemaking and respite and because of the PPEs, which is referred to as, you know, the, the uh, masks, the, the shields, the gowns, the gloves, the uh, all of that went directly to the um, hospitals and clinics to be able to support uh, those people who were sick and came into the hospital. So we didn't have those to be able to continue to keep our, our clients safe and our staff. So we had to um, uh, wait until we could get those and continue to provide personal care services. We have not opened up the other services yet, but we're working on doing that. So when you're looking at essential services and then we can't provide them because we don't have the PEEs to do that, PPEs, excuse me, um, that further uh, exasperates the problem of social isolation because people are living in their own homes 
that need this kind of help and support, and if they can't get it, it does uh, contribute to that problem. Um, we also uh, uh, looking at, um, well, many of you heard the horror stories of nursing homes and assisted livings and retirement communities where in other states, uh, the COVID-19 hit and many older adults died. So what we, what the community has done nationwide has done is shut those, the, what it's been shutting it down means that they can't let their family members come in. The only people that can come in are staff and those people providing those necessary cares and those facilities. So that in itself created um, I want to say miserable loneliness and social isolation of which continues today um, and the nursing homes and family members are have been trying to use tablets with um, you know zoom and other features so they can at least see each other and uh, the other part that has been really difficult I think that um, Dr. Baird will probably touch on this is uh, when people are dying and they can't be with their loved ones because of that uh, separation. So those are the uh, things that we have experienced. Um, we certainly have found out that we have gaps and we're trying to fill those gaps. Um, and we created a telecare program where volunteers have uh, are calling people that are either referred to us or self-referral and they're the ones that uh, will call and check in. What we're finding is that works okay, but people really need some kind of, they need to be able to see people, they need to have some kind of a connection. And their routines have been um, significantly disrupted. So if they normally went to the senior center and then they volunteered at some organization, they went to church, all those things that we take for granted, that all got disrupted. So how do we create a new routine for people? And it's not just older adults, it's everyone. I have a son with developmental disabilities who's 30 and he had the rug pulled out from under him and that going to Opportunity Resources and to the YMCA, nothing and what kind of behaviors you start to see. And you see it in older adults too, where they sleep all day, um, they just disrupt their whole habits and their health um, becomes at risk. And so uh, trying to recognize that this isn't gonna go away, we're not gonna see phase three, where everything's opened up until a vaccine is developed. So we are having to figure out how do we continue to safely do business and help people with these social isolation and loneliness issues um, that they're experiencing. Uh, one thing we have done is we've applied for some grants to get tablets and then hope to um, be able to loan those out to individuals who don't have technology and that they'll have internet access right on them. And we can teach them to set them up with Zoom and do some very basic uh, searches, teach them how to order groceries um, online and help them connect with family and friends visually so that they don't feel so isolated. Uh, so we're trying to get uh, order um, and pay for uh, 50 tablets in order to launch this program. It's been successful in other parts of the country, but it's how do we do that safely uh, Why people are staying at home. Um, I guess the important part for me is uh, to let you know that this isn't going away. Um, people are, now we are seeing a greater number of older adults with loneliness and social isolation. Um, and uh, we're doing our best to help people with that. Um, and I hope that all of you who have any older relatives that you will reach out and teach them how to use Zoom or FaceTime if they don't already. Uh, if you have 
uh, members in your community or you have uh, in your neighborhood that are older, check in with them, but please make sure you use everything that you're supposed to, your mask, sanitizing, gloves, and do maybe even some, offer to get groceries for them if they don't haven't already figured that out. Refer them to us if you're concerned about their ongoing well-being and we'll make sure we can check on people and find ways to provide them support. But this is something that Missoula Aging Services can't do on their own. We really need everybody's help in this pandemic to not let so many uh, older adults slip away into loneliness. We've had problems with those that feel like they wanna commit suicide because life is just not as, this means I've gotta stop. Um, it just means that, uh, uh, you know, that, that they don't feel like there's any meaning to life anymore if they can't get out and do the things that they used to do. And we've had people who have cancer or in the end of life who are risking going into social gatherings because for them, if they die of the cancer in the next six months or of the virus, that's, that connected, connectedness to others means a great deal. So if you have questions, let me know. I hope you, it gives you an idea of the significant impact on people uh, that social isolation and loneliness has on older adults um, and their caregivers and people with disabilities. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Tina Barrett. Thank you, Susan. It's exciting to hear all the beautiful, creative, innovative, approaches happening in our communities during this time. I'm going to share my screen and invite you into a glimpse of Tamarack Grief Resource Center during this time and where we're going from here. So as we talk today, I want to touch base a little bit on an intro to TGRC, talk about grief amidst COVID-19, uh, COVID um, and then creating healing spaces. How do we really come together and take care of ourselves and one another during this time, and what does this look like in grief organizations as well as communities? And so Tamarack Grief Resource Center, on the most basic level, strengthens and honors individuals, families, and communities throughout their journey with grief. We have offices, we're based out of Missoula. We have offices in Kalispell and Browning. We have a couple of commercial vehicles that take the show on the road other places. But the hope is really to meet all people where they're at in their journey with grief. Grief is a natural response to loss. We don't choose to grieve or not grieve. Uh, it is a behavioral, social, intellectual, creative, spiritual journey that unfolds in response to any loss. Many of our programs are bereavement focused, focusing on the death of someone significant, a loved one, a family member, or someone, a colleague or community member close to us. Um, but we do support people while in grief of any kind. I want to share a quick photo of our team pre-COVID just because the comments and words I share are are part of a collective of a whole group of people that commit their world to this. We did serve nearly 6,000 people last year through counseling, grief education, and grief support. Um, that number really reflects individual stories that each person that we meet has their own unique experience and may we strengthen and honor them. Most people know about Tamarack because of our Camp to Remember, a grief camp that started in 1997. It's one of the oldest grief camps in the country, and indeed, we will celebrate year 25 next summer. So I think I shared the first summer on Georgetown Lake with about 13 kiddos and four other staff, and now we're growing to serve hundreds of, of kids and families in grief camps every year. What I hope you see in these images is that mix of how do we create appealing experiences to honor that grief is a natural response to loss, but also an opportunity to honor and remember, as you see in the candle lighting ritual or the creative activities of see you in the stars or whatever are those moments, those things that give us strength throughout our grief experience. We've added a lot of mini camps or day camps for younger kiddos. These happen year round and you'll see a lot of this is outdoor based adventures. Our teen programs might involve wildland adventures or 
planting healing gardens or leadership training opportunities. Parent guardian workshops, one of the best ways we support grieving kids is to support their systems, their teachers, their parents, uh, parent experiences when they're amidst their own grief and they're the primary support for a grieving child, how can we shore them up and honor their experience and give them permission to grieve as well as offer simple and honest responses and be a supportive presence for their little ones. Community workshops take a lot of different forms from just taking a walk along the river to say let's walk about it um, rather than let's talk about it when words fall short. And what you'll hear in my words is so many of these activities, school-based activities, were shut down with COVID. So um, here's some of the school-based activities. We served thousands of kids last year by going into schools throughout Montana and helping people become increasingly comfortable talking about end of life and death and what do these terms mean and how do we uh, cope and self-regulate and recenter ourselves during the toughest of times. Our support groups are for kids and adults. And critical responses for workplaces or schools when there's been a death or tragedy that impacts an organization. I think for many of you gathered on this call today, I recognize your names as leaders in the community. And when our task is to, to lead an organization or run an organization that we want to lead in a compassionate manner, how do we honor grief when it rocks our workplace and keep the show rolling? while also taking care of one another in, in that workplace. Suicide prevention and postvention is a huge part of our role throughout Western Montana. We partner closely with Project Tomorrow and the Nate Shute Foundation here in Montana, as well as the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors as we uh, lead, consult on their programs for youth who've experienced a death by um, a family member who has died by suicide. Because what we know is postvention and effectively supporting people after a death by suicide is in a key and critical part of suicide prevention. So the way we're really going to make a difference in this is by more effective postvention strategies and counseling. We have about five clinicians on staff, and especially in response to traumatic grief, group situations are not thought to be highly recommended until at least about three months has elapsed. Usually your own experience is so intense that being around others can be a little bit too overwhelming to hold that raw, intense emotional experience um, beyond your own as well. So a lot of a lot of different options of this, this TAPS partnership that I described, we, we do serve as the senior consultant for youth programs, but these are there's a variety of tragedy assistance program for survivors programs that we work with to work with military families who've experienced the death of a service member. One of the most important work that, that Tamara focuses on is grief education. How can we expand this circle of care? So this is why I love conversations like today of how can we as the community become increasingly comfortable talking about end of life and grief and creating healing spaces for one another and for ourselves during the toughest of times. This particular picture was speaking in Park City, which might be the most beautiful place I've had a chance to present. Um, but indeed, we don't pass up an opportunity if a school asks us to do an in-service and is like, we're really sorry, you really only have seven minutes. Like, thank you, we want the seven minutes. A lot can be covered in seven minutes and we'll move into those opportunities for sure. So a few thoughts and biases about grief that I bring in. Indeed, it's a natural and individual response to loss. Although it's natural, it can be incredibly complex. I appreciate Therese Rando's words. If it's not hurting you or someone else, it's probably okay. When we think through grief and common responses, there's this apathy or questioning and difficulty concentrating and difficulty completing goals, feeling sleepy or overwhelmed, increased errors and irritability, and shattered sense of comfort and routines. Why did I share this? This is what we were experiencing during COVID. So now what we have is a collective veil of grief that our universe, our communities, our individuals, our families, our friends are moving through. This is not terrifying, it's just an isness. It's a natural response to loss. Our routines, our patterns, our roles, our ways of functioning have been pulled out from under us. How do we regain our footing? How do we re-find hope? How do we make sense of our world? How do we honor 
the loss of what was while also experiencing hope for what is to become. And that's our, our challenge as, as a community as we, as we move from here. And indeed, with COVID-19, what are we hearing? Fears. Fears for personal health and the health of our loved ones, the health of those around us. Changes of our days, of our routines, of our roles, of our responsibilities, of the ways of making it through the world. Disruptions in our coping strategies. We had ways of moving through the world and ways to cope. We might have someone we would get together and talk to. We might get a hug from somebody. We might go to the gym. But the ways that we found strength or centered ourselves, our self-regulation strategies during the toughest of times, have been thrown out and we're challenged now to find new ones while also facing the fears, the changes, the challenges beyond that. Financial challenges and job changes all merge together. Whether that be job loss for many people, remote work for many people, or the risk of exposure for those still returning to work, uh, and the physical distancing that has ramifications across the board between the social isolation that Susan outlined so clearly, as well as access to care, visitation limitations if someone goes into care or into hospitalization, the way we memorialize if there's a death in a family or in a community, and changes in how we show we care. How often do we just read over and place an understanding hand on the arm of someone next to us or want to offer a hug when someone's going through a hard time and there's no words and we just stretch out our arms. And now it's not that we can't show community and can't show we care, but we're challenged to find whole new ways. The strain on healthcare is significant. Some strong research has come out of China just over these last few months illuminating increased incidences of depression, anxiety, insomnia, distress, and overall moral fatigue of simply the decisions have to be made around who can we support and how can we support and how do we stretch out our resources as far as we possibly can. This is happening, I, I believe, in the nonprofit world as it seems like many of us are adapting, not only getting our programming, going to new places, but creating new systems. The strategic plan that came up has been recreated with multiple plan Bs and Cs and Ds, um, and then just some real fatigue of how do we do this as well as we can um, while just simply going through the motions. So grief programs amidst COVID. A beautiful thing of being in this field is I, I feel it's our job to build community and find ways of support and the grief field. I. I think has shined through this. There's a group of about 83 executive directors that run grief centers around the country that have gotten together on Mondays since late March once a week to say, how do we do this better? How, what are the ethics of this? How do we do telehealth? Um, how do we take care of our personnel? How do we announce uh, furloughs or um, handle layoffs or revamp programs and work with development. The learning curve is steep. Um, the technology needs are very different and then investments in not only purchasing new technology and new software, but learning to use it effectively and efficiently and therapeutically. Uh, Tamarack, all our counseling shifted to telehealth. Our programs shifted online. Uh, on March 16th, we had a national uh, presentation we were hosting hundreds of people from throughout Montana to come the plan was to come to the University of Montana as we've done every year since 2005 to bring a national caliber speaker to say how do we ever better support grief in Montana um, purchase new systems and train the speaker who was very uncomfortable with this model and hosted an incredible seminar but this is within two days of, of work from home being implemented and and within weeks, I just want to give a shout out to our program staff, within days just got the mini camps, the support groups, the telehealth and counseling all moved online with the exception of our camps that are most known. So the, the women's camp in May was canceled and so the overnight camp programming um, were not held. We actually, many programs around Montana and the nation are continuing to do virtual camps so far, we haven't called our virtual programs camps. I think it's a little part of us that kind of clings to what we created in 24 years ago on the shores of Georgetown Lake. And now we host over six camps a year that 
what we call camp, there won't be that semblance of it virtually. What we can do is create those opportunities for connection, for building coping strategies, for increasing a network of care, for honoring the stories and the memories of those that we've loved and lost, and how do we redefine that relationship and continue to get strength from it when someone's no longer walking on the earth. We can do those things. I'm not sure we can do camp. So uh, Tamarack's still playing with that a little bit. But the educational programs have shifted online. And then we created a whole array of new programs. We created a new program a day. So daily opportunities for eight weeks to stabilize individuals in our community, ranging from mindful moments to kids' corners with coping strategies uh, that unfolded. The building community, this Zoom picture in the corner is, has been many of our realities for, for months now, but I've been really impressed with what's unfolded with the kids coming together to, to learn new tools for self-regulation strategies. Susan described how many people, when they become stressed, really slow down and just don't want to get out of bed. So that's a hypoarousal response, that there's a slowdown in speech, uh, difficulty finding words and isolation, a kind of curling up in a ball to despondency. Another response equally common is hyperarousal of people becoming agitated, irritable, rapid talking, agitation, and maybe then volatile. So what we're looking for is kind of this window of tolerance that we all function in. How do we expand that during these tricky times? And so most of these programs we're developing is around how do we help people feel regulated or expand that ability to re-regulate re when they get thrown outside that regulation that space. There's been a lot of ways we build community. We sent care kits out to all of our kids and families and called them and posted reunions and book clubs and psycho ed really with these ideas to stabilize. So the biggest call for new services has been around how do we take care of the care providers immersed in this work and um, increased our frequency of staff meetings as well as encouraging a culture of wellness and per personal communication. We at Tamarack did experience the death of a staff member during this window of time. And so it was a very personal professional blend of um, how memorials are handled and how we can support one another and just acknowledging this is happening in our communities and all, all throughout Montana. And I just want to extend just a, a little virtual hug to all of you, knowing you've been touched by loss. We all are as humans, it's part of our experience. There's a mixed bag of donor behavior. I believe people have been incredibly generous. Um, many have paused giving or are giving less out of necessity and out of fear and uncertainty of what's to come. Some people are giving more. Uh, we did cancel our annual fundraiser, um, but we hosted a different virtual event that was a very nice community event. And so, what we see is people have been amazingly generous, especially the, the top recipients of the funds have been religious groups, um, as well as food banks and coronavirus relief funds. So indeed we're hitting challenges. I would say Zoom fatigue is on the top of the list as far as people just a little tired of Zoom meetings and us needing to get really creative of, of what we can do beyond Zoom, as well as a pressure to expand our reach while reestablishing, say in our world, grief programs while also just revamping nonprofit functioning of how are we raising money and running a, a show during this time. Creating healing spaces, some takeaways I would send us all off with would be the idea of how do we stay in a relaxed body and what does that mean for you? Blatant and radical self-care. Um, some things we know as far as recentering or regulating, breathing, walking, and simply being outside a, a whole host of research that that I dove into as part of my doctoral studies and beyond that was not manipulating the natural world, just simply being outside. So the more we can do that or create those opportunities, if, um, if there's people that can't go outside, interacting with natural materials or the views can be incredibly restorative. Resisting making big changes and extending the most generous interpretation of just trusting one another that we're doing our darndest. How can we acknowledge that we will be touched and impacted? give ourselves permission to feel, um, feel deeply and be glad we do. We're human and we're sensitive. Um, 
and avoiding some cliches as we try to reach out to support each other of saying, well, you're never given more than you can handle. Let's try to avoid some of those comments. But instead asking, how can I show you I care right now? I wish I could give you a hug right now. How could I express my care for you? What's most challenging for you? And indeed expressing gratitude. I'll end with a little poem from Sandra Bertman. In saying this, we must also state that like the world crisis, this work contains both dangers and opportunities. In opening us up to our greatest anxieties, it allows us to touch and know ourselves in a way that's not often available to us in our protective culture. One of the gifts is the possibility of knowing ourselves more deeply understanding what others' experiences mean for us. And for this, we offer thanks. I really want to thank the Women's Giving Circle and the Missoula Community Foundation for making this conversation possible. And I look forward to questions and dialogue of what comes up for you all and our thoughts together. I'll um, pass this to a question and response time and, and look at the chat. And I hear Anne's comment, I'm sick of Zoom. I know. There is, there is one question um, from, it says, I would guess that lots of people don't realize that what they are feeling is grief. How can we help the community identify its grief and connect them with resources in Tamarack and elsewhere? The grief it can be a charged word and it means so many things. So Dr. Barrett, what would you say about helping people identify that it is grief? And it's okay. And it's okay. And, How do we yeah, destigmatize okay. grief? That it just is an isness. We don't choose to grieve or not grieve. And what we're really watching for is back to those words of Therese Rando. If it's not hurting you or someone else, it's probably okay. I also appreciate research that can be strobe and shoot around the dual process model of grief, really looking at grief is a loss orientation of what are we missing? but also it's a looking forward. What are we creating and what are the opportunities? And people get often stuck in one spot or the other as we all grieve differently. And some are more focused on what's missing and really being caught by what isn't a possibility. And others are so busy creating what can be and what's going on. And then that can cause stress in relationships or workplaces because people feel like others don't get them. Like, wait, you're not even impacted by this or you don't feel deeply or whatever it might be. I think um, normalizing it, my hope is that some of our activities like the birth book clubs or community workshops allow people to step into a grief program in a way towards a familiar conversation that they would want to have anyway. Like, oh, where the crawdads sing? Who doesn't want to read that book? <laughs> like, let's all dive in and toss through it together. So my hope is that there's some programs like that. I also think that if you're really feeling like someone deserves support, offering to go with them or make a call with them. Right now, it could be a conference call to say, I really hope you deserve more support than I can give you right now. I'm really concerned about you. Let's make a call together and I can be on the call with you. But let's, let's pull in more support. I will still be here, but we're gonna call Tamarack also. And I think people tend to think there should be a timeline, you know? <laughs> You should be better in three months, in six months, in a year. You lose your husband, uh, you get to grieve for X amount of weeks and then get over it. We have to get over that too. There is no timeline. And people do no grieve timeline. very differently. I have one question. One of the things you talked about was access to care. How do I, let's say, how do I determine my comfort level to go back to a dentist, to go to the eye doctor? If I haven't been in their site and I don't know what they're doing, how do I make myself walk in the door? Are we talking about an anxiety to access care or uh, um, increased yeah. comfort? With comfort level. How do I determine my comfort level going back to the eye doctor or the dentist or whoever? Yeah, one thing I really want to validate is that um, as people come up with their comfort of what works for them, of how do we help validate that and shore you up, each of you? Because I think some people are like, I'm a mask wearer, but then I went somewhere and no one was wearing masks except me. Okay, to wear the mask. Or this happened in youth court in Helena yes, uh, on Monday, that there was a couple of people that were like, aren't we modeling behavior for families. Why are we not requiring wearing masks in court? And it's like, if that makes you feel more comfortable, 
please ask the person around you to wear a mask, wear a mask yourself, or do what you need to to stay safe and ask the questions to stay safe. Then also making the decisions of what needs to happen, what doesn't, because there can be those questions around, um, do I need to go to the dentist right now? Or could it be possible to wait? Mm -hmm consulting with someone. Anxiety is another issue. I really want to, that's where the recentering strategies and techniques for when we need to move in and through, say, even the grocery store can be anxiety um, inducing for many people right now. So how can we ground ourselves in what can we see? What can we hear? What steps am I taking for the kind of the cognitive and bio uh, sensual regulation strategies as we move into those stressful circumstances? Susan, did you want to jump in on that too? Yeah, so you don't mind, am I unmuted? You're good. You okay, um, so what we have been telling at least our older adults who have a lot of anxiety about returning is one is to call and ask in advance, what are you doing? to be protective of people. Like we used the example of going to a dentist or a doctor's appointment or a chiropractor. And you know, you have in your own mind what would make you feel safe and call in advance and find out if that provider does those kinds of things. The other thing is, um, yeah, there's a great deal of anxiety right now about the fact that some people wear masks and others don't. Um, and it makes people feel very uncomfortable reminding people that masks protect the other person, not you. And so, um, uh, as many of you may know, the Board of Housing, or excuse me, the, the Board of Health is meeting on Thursday to determine whether they're going to make masks mandatory in Missoula County. And likely, based on the fact that the city, county commissioners, mayor, Missoula Aging Services and several other people are weighing in. I would say that um, masks will become mandatory. That will help people um, because then it also helps businesses say, hey, it's not us, it's that health department. Uh, we've got to make sure you have a mask. You can't come in without that. And right now they're uh, feeling uncomfortable and older adults too are feeling uncomfortable. I mean, I'm an older adult and I, um, am absolutely amazed and stunned by the lack of uh, mask wearing and social distancing. So hopefully that will also reduce people's anxiety. Ask first before you go in what they're doing towards it and the second part of it, you're gonna get a, probably a little help by the end of this week with making masks mandatory. I hope so. Um, Cause that would happen, that would help with one of the other uh, questions. I think it was from Molly with the, uh, they're starting to have their volunteers come back to work, working outside, you know, socially distanced, very safe. Uh, but visitors are not necessarily following those guidelines. And I think the, the, the leader, the answer has to be that the, it has to come from the leadership of the organization. The organization has to decide, yes, you have to have a mask. Yes, you have to socially distance. Um, it shouldn't be up to the volunteer to have to remind a visitor um, they need the backup of the organization itself. But Susan, there was another question for you um, that had to do with volunteering at the aging services. If someone were interested in, let's say, establishing a phone tree, if you had a group of seniors that you wanted to help keep connected, um, if there could be a phone tree started, would you be interested in something like that? And how would somebody volunteer with you? Well, uh, first they can call our agency 728-7682 or visit our website at missoulaagingservices.org. Um, and I just, I guess what, uh, we launched this telecare program where we have volunteers who are calling people that are either referred to us or self-referral um, that are really struggling. Um, it's, you think it'd be a feel good, uh, opportunity, but we found in some cases that people got really offended by being called and that they don't know how to handle when somebody says they're suicidal. And so we've had to make some training for the volunteers that are in it. And we've limited that program until we can figure out all the components that we need to have, 
um, to make those phone calls so that we don't end up with any volunteer feeling terribly uncomfortable or bad because the person yelled at them because they're agitated. As uh, Dr. Barrett brought up, um, agitation is a big thing. And uh, especially with older adults that they just want to go back to their normal routine. And that is not going to happen. So it's really a big shift of us trying to help people create new routines. And certainly whether it's phone calls, Zooms, FaceTime, or being able to get outside in a safe way, um, we're really trying to put that together. So that was a long-winded way of saying you can call, you can offer to volunteer. I think we're limiting it right now um, until we can figure out all the training components uh, that are necessary. Uh, Dr. Barrett, I forgot to give you my condolences on losing your colleague. That must have been very, very tough. Still is, like you said, it's not something we get over. We just we define that relationship and find ways to find strength. We've had incredible support from others. Thank you, Terry. And Tina is fine. Thank you for acknowledging that uh, degree and Tina B to all of you. <laughs> Just Tina. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm from New England, so we're a little bit more formal than that. <laughs> <laughs> the military circles are very honoring of it too, I would say. Um, I see that we're out of time. Is there anything else you would like to add at the, the end? Any final words from either one of you, Susan or Dina? Um, I think that uh, a lot of things that Tina said about self-care um, is important because as you're going to get a lot, whether you have children, whether you have uh, aging parents, you're going to get a lot of demands or feel a lot of demands. Um, and trying to help them through this. And so uh, some of the basic self-care that um, Tina brought up is important for everybody. And don't hesitate to re reach out, in our case, Missoula Aging Services, and we can talk through solutions with you and reach out to people you're concerned about. Tina? I'm grateful for the time to have a conversation with you all. I, hearing all of us have shared a sentiment of Zoom fatigue and yet all of you moving into this conversation gives me such tremendous hope for who we are as a community and who we want to be and what we will create together um, in Montana. So thank you for that, Susan. Thanks for the reminder for self-care for everyone as well. I think self-indulgence and self-care get tangled and we're not here to judge self-indulgence at all but certainly that wish for blatant self-care of what's going to help you feel stronger and more centered during this time. And thank you for this time for this conversation. Well, I probably recognize the self-indulgence more than anything else because I'm having a horrible time staying six feet away from my refrigerator. <laughs> um, so close. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Susan and Tina, for your presentation. Absolutely fascinating. Our next webinar will be in mid-August with the date to be determined and we'll present information on local impacts of the pandemic from the medical standpoint. Keep an eye on our Facebook page on the Women's Giving Circle for exact information. Thank you everyone. Please stay safe and go wash your hands. <laughs> Thank you.